Welcome to another Funky Marketing episode. And today we're going to talk about the topic that I like a lot. Uh, I don't know if you know, but usually the best strategies are those data nerds that get into the metrics, into the analytics, into the everything, analyze everything so they can create, come up with the best strategy, right? So my guest today is uh, Charlie the Tribo, or we can say Charlie, I guess, Charlie. Yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm going to introduce him for a, for a few seconds and then he'll uh, tell us what, what did I miss. He's a revenue strategist with uh, experience in managing budget that are exceeding uh, $100 million across interest, industries like tech, like automotive, like finance. Uh, and today we're going to cover a lot of stuff from how the bar journey changed how we can use data to analyze it and to kind of match the way that experience changed, the flows of multi-touch attribution. Uh, and basically, we're gonna, he's going to tell us how he uh, you know, uses uh, everything that he does to forecast uh, ARR. So, Charlie, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, so uh, I help companies, uh, spe specifically long uh companies with long consideration products in B2B and B2C. Uh, that's something. Um, so we are working on the same problems. And so what I what I do is that I help companies to optimize uh, entire go to market. So obviously for uh, B2C will be mainly marketing focus, but for B2B, I also look at the way we can optimize sales and marketing altogether. Um, I am um, I spent 10 years in the financial industry. I actually have a background in financial engineering. And uh, then I moved into data science and then I, uh, I into data science working for Sky, which uh, was one of the first company uh, giving, providing uh, Google Ads, a bidding model before smart bidding. And then I moved to Oracle where I learned um, B2B marketing. And uh, and so and and now I'm working for uh, I created recently Growth Dynamics, where I I try to solve the problem I've seen over my career, and uh, what I try to do is that um, is bring all of those uh, financial backgrounds and the way we do work with data in finance and bringing them into measurement into marketing. Love that. Uh, give me just a second, because usually when you're running things, you forget the light. Now we look nicer. Uh, so uh, that's great to hear. And it's usually kind of the career that I hear um, that a lot of, uh, you know, experts in specific niche or industry have. You know, you enter uh, the industry, you work at a company, you observe how decisions are being made, how, you know, what are the problems. And, and then you see, okay, these are the problems that I can actually solve. And then you can do it while being in the company or you can, you know, start a startup or a different company or get into, you know, uh, establishing yourself as a solution for that specific problem. Yeah, exactly. That's what I, uh, that's what I decided to do a couple of months ago now, or three months ago now. And uh, yeah, it's all very exciting. I'm still finding out how to, so how to, 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 to create all the bridge all together, like including managing a company, you know how it is. Uh, so I've, I'm definitely learning a lot at this stage, uh, but I can already like help a lot of companies. I have a lot of discussion with a lot of companies and uh, and I find, uh, I find the subject very interesting because there's a lot to be done in the measurement, um, in the measurement, on the measurement side, and specifically for long, conver a long consideration service and products. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And that's the topic that, uh, that's why I, you know, wanted to talk with you about all these things because the way I see it, you know, I talk with a lot of marketers, salespeople as well, but usually marketers sometimes, even though they, they want to impact the revenue, they want to get closer to the revenue, right? A lot of marketers don't want to do that because mm -hmm. they don't want responsibility, but uh, they want to get closer to it. But the way they are measured, the way their work is measured it's not actually aligned with the goal that is requested for them to achieve, right? So, so I usually tell the companies, you know, sometimes you do marketing to fail because of the way you are measuring their efforts and their activities. Uh, but so 
I just want to get your thoughts on that and maybe we can go into, you know, how do you see that the whole space and, and the way we actually buy today in B2B has changed and how that impacted, uh, you know, measurements and other stuff. Yeah, so to jump back on what you said, um, Charlie Munger, uh, one of the biggest investors in history, said once, tell me the outcome, uh, tell me the incentive and I'll tell you the outcome. And that's very much uh, a problem I see a lot in B2B, much less in B2C. Uh, the reason is because B2C is much closer to financial outcome because there's no sales, uh, sales team involved a lot, while in B2B you have the sales involved. And very often, uh, most of the sales is attributed to sales and uh, and we we tend to not correctly measure the impact of our marketing on this and so when we decide to have lead targets for example well you're going to have leads for sure uh, but that doesn't mean that you're going to have revenue and growth <laughs> and so and so that's um and i i do see that i do see the problem of a lot of company not really understanding uh, the importance of brand the which is which is basic fundamentals uh, a business fundamentals when you think about it it's about creating brand loyalty it's about creating a moat uh, for example uh, Warren Buffett in a lot of shareholders letters always repeated brand is the key for strong move and, uh, and long-term growth and that's what they were actually looking when they buy when they bought a big stake in Apple and McDonald the reason why they did that is because of the uh, the brand and unfortunately in B2B today what I see is a very much under investment in brand and over investment in outbound, outbound strategies what uh, we use to what we call predictable revenue which definitely is not working as much as uh, as it used to because the bio journey has changed and yeah. uh, and that's a good segue to move to the bio journey so what has changed um so let's let's go back to to 2012 2010 because that will help us to understand why we have lead uh, targets in the first place. So we had very limited social media. The only reason you would go on social media is to see the pictures of your friend's dogs. Uh, no, things have changed a lot. And and you had like, don't you didn't have much information online either. And so when you had a problem to solve, you would just Google it and click on the first three links. So I remember at Sky, I did the research and we found out that 80% of the clicks happened on the first three links. I don't know if it's still the case now, but it was the case five years ago. And and so and so the 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 self-directed buyer journey from the buyer was very small. It was googling it, going on the website, and then contact, uh, click on the contact page, and then and then the sales team would call, and then the sale the salesperson would present the case and do all the and do provide all the documentation needed and so on. And so you had a little self-direct journey and then a, a long sales uh, journey. Now things have completely changed. Everything is online. The buyer journey is much more longer. And so and so now what the buyers want to do is they want to shortlist the candidates before they even want to talk to the sales team. Exactly. And, and so you need to be on the top of the mind. You need to create content. You need to provide value because otherwise, otherwise you're just not shortlisted. And this is why outbound strategy do not work cold what I call cold outbound because there's a, I do the difference between warm outbound and cold outbound. We can go to. I, I do it too. I do it too. I was just talking with, with some people like when I do outreach on LinkedIn to the already existing connections, I don't call that cold outbound messages, right? No, no, exactly. And, and so, and so what you see is that cold outbound doesn't work that much anymore because it has no value. The buyer doesn't know you. And so, and so that, that was, has completely changed. And that's what, the that's why the concept of lead target is completely outdated because you need to focus on your brand uh, first yeah i totally agree with that and also i, I would that we are spending much more time on social than doing our real jobs right interacting yeah. with peers with people with friends i mean we even reading you know uh educational stuff about business became a normality Right, some something that we just go to LinkedIn to read things about business. But outside of that, uh, additionally, one more thing that I would like to add is, you know, like the uh, birth of the small communities, small specialized communities, when we have like at least ten people that we trust and we follow, mm -hmm. and that also impacts especially how we create those short list uh, which we use to kind of start the research for the right 
you know, vendor or product or whatever we are buying. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I see it for me. I have a lot of people uh, contacted me, telling me that they love my content and the converse and I always ask if I can help, obviously, uh, because I'm always interested to, to listen to some use case. But when I, I'm not selling at this stage, right? And, but I know that at some point when the person needs what need to solve the problem I'm solving, the person will think about me. And, and that's, that's how, that's how brands should think is how can we be on the top of the mind and how can we, uh, improve our perceived value, um, against the competition. Yeah. So, um, moving forward, I had Rory Sutherland on the podcast and he said one thing that is kind of always a controversial topic, but you know, we'll see if, if, if it is that controversial today, but you know, um, looking at data and only the data uh, to guide our decisions means making decisions to go in the past instead of moving forward. So just wanted to add that and maybe we can move into how we actually use the data today the right way. So uh, is it is it really? So yes, the data. So but yeah, but that's what we use in finance. So well, in finance, you would look at what worked in the past and you replicate it, hoping that uh, that it will work again and you will be, make money of that. Um, you have you have like a trillion trillion uh, trillion dollar uh, fund fund market, which everybody does that and it is working. And so this. So you what you have to understand is that. The, the past can very often be a good representation of the future, but you have to understand that also the market change over time. And so you have to, you have to move with the market. And so you have to, um, so that's interesting because we're moving back to trading now. So what we do in trading is that you have that strategy that's built on what is done in the past, but you also, you control, you look at for drift, what we call model drift. And so we look at if, the model behaves differently than it used to to define if there has been any market change that could render the model uh, useless and so and so you we have to do the same work and the way we do and this is why for example when we do a uh, incrementality test you can't mm -hmm. just do one incrementality test and just say okay that's that's how much meta brings you have to repeat that test uh over and over again um i would say if i have to give a number i would say quarterly uh, to be to be able to to really to really track the ch any any changes because a lot of change can happen. Uh, a channel can change the way uh, the way to, to, to do impression. The quality of your audience can change. There are so many things that can change over time, and this is why you always have to to follow up on the quality of your model. I totally agree. And, and to move to move into the the models and, and all these things before we get into that. The, the discussion that I'm seeing everywhere on LinkedIn, talking with companies, talking with other stuff, most of the companies are just stick to their, you know, G analytics. They, they, you know, usually they're saying we can measure everything there, even if it's not, you know, connected with the CRM, which is mm -hmm. like madness in today's world, but still for some of the companies, they still didn't change that. So like, for example, in analytics, you see the channels, you see what's, you know, uh, that are appearing over there when you're having some action already getting traffic from or conversions, but you don't see what happened on those channels, right? Yeah. So we came up with self-reported attribution when we actually get the, the qualitative data, right? Basically, the way I look at it, it's the last thing somebody remembers about us when they see the form and they fill, they fill in the form. Mm -hmm. So Intel tells us in a way what's happening in specific channel, right? Did we, did they see us in the community? Which video was that? Or did somebody refer us, uh, you know, who was that person or that company? And we can actually find out if marketing efforts are getting results. Mm -hmm. But there are still a lot of gaps between those two and between the models. We see everything differently if we, we look at different models. So maybe we can get into, into all this stuff. Yeah. So the self-report attribution, what is great about it is that it's it's a it has a very uh, low um, a very high return investment. Like it's a very low cost implementation, and the feedback you get from it is amazing. Uh, what is very important to go back to the subject we had earlier is that we know that brand is important. Self-attribution is capable to to track word of mouth, 
uh, to track upper funnel content, something that multi-touch attribution or MMM cannot specifically do in uh, long sales cycles. And so I would, um, and I can give an example. Um, I would like to give an example and then we can talk about, start to talk about MTA. So I work with a very big e-com company uh, at the moment. It's a half a billion dollar revenue. And, and so they, we, we did a test with uh, one of the best e-com MTA uh, available on the market. And, and they said that 1% uh, of the revenue was attributed to Meta. But when you look at self-attribution, 30% of the revenue was attributed to Meta. And so you, you, that's, that's, and, and that's why having self-attribution in place is so important is I, we can always say, yes, people might forget. There has been multiple channels. It's difficult. It's true. But what's, what is important to think the way it, we should think is that what the user is going to put in that form is what they remember the most. So it was it it was maybe not the first one, but it was what the people remember the most. Um, and and it's a very good way also to control the other models. Because imagine, and I know a lot of companies who just which just use MTA. So imagine you just use it. If that company just used MTA and didn't have such attribution, we wouldn't flag that, and it would have uh, lent, You would they would have waste that. Uh, were lost opportunity revenue of like more than tens millions of dollars every year. And, and that little self-attribution form say, save tens of dollars, ten, tens of millions of dollars every year. So um, definitely I would warmly recommend anybody to, uh, to put it in place. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's a small thing basically. And, and you know, ju just for the note of everybody listening, don't use that for PPC or advertising usage just for, for organic things. Cause you know, if you do it for advertising, it will make a huge mess and you won't get anything out of it. Yeah. So the, the way, so we, we have demand generation and demand capture. And so PPC would be more on the demand capture side and self attribution is more for demand generation, understand where we uh, generated the demands. Uh, definitely. Um, but it's great because, for example, if you look at uh, forms that comes from PPC, and then you can understand the journey of the people and what you'll be see. For example, well, what I've seen a lot, for example, for companies being active on LinkedIn is that they would say LinkedIn on self attribution, but they would have clicked on the ad on Google. And so the reason is because people saw something on LinkedIn, they Googled it, like everybody, they click on the first link because uh, somebody put a the marketing team decided to put a brand search uh, key term. We can talk about this too, about the effectiveness of that, and then went on a website through this. Uh, but is what is great is that then you can start to questions like, did we need to spend the money on the branded keyword on Google search because it, it the the the, com the user was going on the website anyway, right? Um, and uh, I mean, if we can quickly talk about this, what I usually suggest is that we do. A pre-post test, so we are uh, we turning it off uh, brand uh, brand keywords, and then we turn it off again later, and we see if there is any incremental lift, and that should give you a more specific idea of the value of uh, of brand brand search because brand search definitely cannibalize organic traffic uh, without a doubt, um, and that's where I usually see a lot of money wasted in B two B. Yeah, exactly. I can just add, add an example, just using and looking at the uh, Google ads. You know, uh, an account had the search campaigns, they had the performance max campaigns, and they had remarketing campaign display, right? So, and from their perspective, it seems like performance max was working really well, mm -hmm. right? Because it gave them cheap leads. And it was going well, they have, you know, uh, a good organic traffic. But when you go and look at it and analyze it really well, like what the search engine is, which keywords are converting and how it's going. Mm. Actually, what you see is that performance marks is basically cannibalizing the search. Yeah. Right. And, and using only, you know, those easy keywords because it's connected to the Google search console. It can get all the data about, you know, which... Um, keywords are getting the, the, the right traffic and just try to, to convert all of them as many as possible. So, uh, you know, uh, that that's a common situation that I'm, that I'm seeing, especially now with Google is pushing performance marks, like it will give you conversions and you need to do that and go along with that. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, so definitely we should do the split between brand search and non-brand search in a report. We should never put it together because it completely buys a result. Uh, the performance max is an interesting one. So there is that belief that, well, I'm not a fan at all at um, letting Google doing the bidding. Uh, just it's it's not because I believe in some in some theories. It's because you know you need to stay in control of what you're doing. It's as simple exactly. as that. So uh, so this is why I'm not a, f a big fan of Pmax. Although um, what I did, I once I tried to see the impact of Pmax on uh, on website traffic, and interestingly, I could see I could see a positive correlation between uh, Pmax and then direct traffic. So it seems that Pmax was actually for that company was actually bringing. Uh, direct traffic into the website. So people would go on the website through Pmax and then come back later through direct. Um, so when I suspected that I was going to see Pmax cannibalizing anything, I actually saw a slight opposite. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. In this case that I was talking about, what we did is we, we separated brand keywords into the separate search campaign. Mm -hmm. And basically in time now it's teaching performance max, you know, to try to go after other keywords outside of the, of the branded search. Outside of the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. Yeah. Because we had, I think I didn't say that. Yeah. We had branded keywords inside the general search keywords. So it didn't separate them from, mm -hmm. from other search keywords. Yeah, no, we should we should never do that. I know I know Google is suggesting it for smaller accounts, uh, but no, just yeah. And I guess some people doing never do that. <laughs> yeah, also some people doing PPC. I guess you know it's easier for them if the cast if the client doesn't know. You know, they just add one campaign, one search campaign, everything in one, and they just go. It goes back to what we say about Charlie Munger, like. Tell me the incentive, I'll show you the anchor, right? If you said marketing, you need to create leads, well, then PPC will, will cannibalize your organic leads to attribute the leads to themselves. Um, although it's not going to bring any more revenue and actually it's just going to increase cost because you're paying for clicks that you didn't need to pay for. Yeah, so uh, what I wanted to ask you, and I know there are some people who would like to know the answer now talking about, you know, uh, multi-touch attribution and using it and analyzing it to kind of get to know with the with the buyer journey how do they do that so so it, it's very simple uh the data does not exist to be able to connect the whole buyer journey it simply does not exist um and so you can have the most complex model in the world. If the data doesn't exist, you're not going to solve the problem. Uh, so the, so I, I do see a lot of MTA sellers saying like, connect your whole buyer journey, but that's, that's, a very, that's actually a very false statement. You can't. And so what you see is that because the, so the journey is fragmented. So you have piece of journeys and the only piece of journeys that are going to be connected to revenue is the last part of the journey. And so you're going to have an over attribution to retargeting and channels like paid search, lead gen ads, and emails. And that's, that's the ones I usually see. And so, and, and so, and, and so you're not going to understand the impact of earlier channels like Facebook meta for B2C, but also LinkedIn. Um, so LinkedIn content and, and so, and so that's a big problem of MTA is that you're going, if you use multi-touch attribution, you're going to leave a lot of revenue on, on the table. Um, it's, it's, it's not working. So there is in B2B, uh, there are two solutions that come, uh, that, that are presented. So you have the ad view for LinkedIn. So that data is also incomplete. And there are two reasons why. The first is because for confidentiality reasons, they're not allowed to show any any data point that has less than three views per company by time frame. So I mean like per week, by month, depending on how you pull the report. So obviously if you pull by day, you'll have much less data point than if you pull by month, You're much less companies. And, and the other thing is that the ad view will not make the difference between 
a marketing intern who started a week ago with Dan and the CEO, the CFO. And obviously those people have very different uh, decision, decision power within the company. And so that ad LinkedIn AdView presented a solution by a lot of MTA, B2B MTA providers give you the false impression that it solved the problem, but it actually doesn't at all. The, and then also you have, so the advantage of LinkedIn is that you have that ad by, by company because it's a closed ecosystem. Outside that, you have what we call uh, multi-touch impression tools. I don't like to use attribution when I refer to multi-touch simply because by definition, attribution uh, implies causality and there's no causality need a correlation element in MTA. <laughs> we go back to this. So I like to say multi-touch tool. I tend to drop the A. And, and so for the impression MTA, what is very important to understand is that it's a probabilistic models. So those models do best guesses of what has happened, where the view impression happened and when. But the problem is that there's no data to control it. So you can't control the accuracy at all of those models. And so um, and so there is there is a lot of for me, there's a lot of reason to not use those models at all. Um, and I wanted to say some, so it says that's the main thing about the MTA. And, uh, and so, yes, I talked about the causality element. That's also one thing I've, I've noticed is that companies using multi-touch tools to measure marketing performance tend to spend too much on retargeting and on, on paid ad search, because mm -hmm. what they're going to do is that they're going to invest on what is trackable, but not on what drives revenue, one, and two, um, it doesn't mean that those touch points has had any impact on revenue. It doesn't, you know, and you'll, you, you'll end up with some, some weird, uh, some weird conclusion as you, you've seen maybe on LinkedIn, oh, we need uh, X number of impression on LinkedIn to close a deal. This is statistically a complete nonsense to say those kind of things, uh, because there's actually no proof at all that all of those views have, have done anything to, to the, um to to the journey of the buyer and what i've seen what i've noticed um in one big b2b tech company is that what i did is that i compared the sales notes and obviously you can only do that with high ticket because you need sales notes i compared the sales notes with the mta mta tools and they, they say completely different stories and so you end up like pitching sales and saying, oh, we did that to, the, to that opportunity. And then actually sales will come, no, that you didn't do that. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So you'll have, you'll have a prospect. They use, they use a tool in a former company. They change company. They wanted to work with a tool again. They call the sales guy, the, the salesperson, and they start the opportunity. And then you'll have marketing on the other side. like, oh, uh, that icon had 200 views on LinkedIn. Uh, click on, on two content syndic uh, syndication assets and then fill the inbound to an email. But, but that, and those are, those are stories I see most of the time. Like, a good three quarter of the stories between empty and sales notes of, of the analysis are done were different. And so that creates sales and marketing misalignment. And that's a big problem with B2B go to market often today is that you have marketing and sales notes working together, but using that MTA can even act, can actually like technically make the problem even bigger. Yeah, that, that, that's very well, very well said. Usually it's, you know, I'm, most of the time on the marketing side or on the management side, but then, you know, it's marketing is not doing their job again, right? Because the leads, the sales is getting are not people who are ready to buy. Yeah. And, and that becomes the big, now we are, you know, back to how we measure things, how we name things and how we define leads, right? Also important thing in, in whole that, that model, because usually we, I mean, what we said, we take the things from the 20 years ago and we still try to, to you know, to work on them because like we invented leads as they are because management or C-level needed something to prove that marketing is working. And when you are measure on that, you want more and more of these things. And then yeah. if you want more, the quality becomes lower and lower. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Definitely, there is that belief that more leads is more revenue, and it's actually not true at all. Uh, there's actually 
it can lead to less profit because as you said if you if you fl if you flood the sales team with a lot of low value leads you're going to take the ex a salesperson is expensive and so if you send yeah. those people like so many bad leads it's just going to cost you a lot of money for those salesperson to go through all of those leads and what's going to happen is that also they, they're not going to have the right bandwidth to invest on the good leads and and so there's it's i do i do think that maximizing leads can actually lead to less profit in the end because you want to remove all of those bad leads and uh, and so you want there are ways to do that using historical data you can look at the characteristic characteristic the characteristic of the leads and then you can start to see like a, see what lead is working and what leads is not and by experience what i've seen is that there are two leads two types of leads that are working which is inbound and warm mode bound and then you have two types of leads that are work much less which often is interesting to cut is cold outbound and what I call what I call cold leads. And so a cold lead is, as you said, person that is really not ready to buy. It would be, for example, a gated asset. That's a big classic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, ebook form, and then somebody download the ebook form, had to fill had to fill the the, the inf contact information, and then this, and you ask the salesperson to call them. This is this is a, this is really a, a waste of time, and that also um um deteriorate the relationship between sales and marketing i've seen i've seen actually in, in a big company um that it was actually the same company with the sales note is that 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 company uh the sales team actually stopped working on some marketing leads like they didn't want they didn't want to go through with them anymore yeah it happens a lot i saw that as well and one thing to add it gets even worse like what i've seen in, in dark region especially in SaaS companies um is that you know that usually have somebody is visiting like three pages on a website you know add them to the hubspot and then it starts the the, the whole motion starts and, and these guys were just you know reading things mm. it didn't give you any signal that they are ready to go to the next level right yeah. usually i say you know there's there's an article and what you get is the activation the resource Mm -hmm. And this is how you actually see, okay, so for example, I don't know, we have like um, how, to, um, how to design the best sales landing page. And then you have three steps that you can implement now as a resource, mm -hmm. right? And then you see, aha, these guys are actually ready to go and start working on this. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I worked on that. Uh, so I worked on a similar project. So we were looking at the CRM. So it's important to have all the data into one place if you want to do that. But looking at the CRM, looking at what the different people are, what the different people are reading, then you can you can you can stick it together and understand what uh, what audience is more ready to buy than others. Uh, we did we did that to um we did that to uh to prioritize the lead uh, because we're in a situation where there were too many leads and um and so we did that to prioritize the leads and as you would expect a lot of paid search was actually on the bottom of that prioritization list yeah it's usually how, how it happens <laughs> but i mean everything is correlated and it goes along with it that's why we we are talking these days uh you know about uh you know, holistic approach to marketing and all these things. But, you know, we said all the negative things. We said how the model fails and everything. Let's let's kind of get some solutions for the people. Yeah, so from, so I do believe a lot in the use of site traffic. So everything is digital today. And I see, you know, the more impression you have online, the more unbounced traffic you're going to have, the more product page uh, page you're going to have, the more inbound requests you're going to have, the more revenue you're going to have. That correlation works. So, so then, like your 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 job is, and what is great as looking at this is that you split the funnel. So, in modeling, it's when you build a model, uh, you'll find out that it's it's always very difficult to to target something that is that is you know very much in the future and so and 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 so if you split the funnel you make it easier. it's a bit like if you go to a shooting range it's easier to shoot a target at five meters than at 10 
Well, models work, models work exactly the same way. So if you split the funnel, you make the life of models much easier. And so by splitting, by splitting the funnel, you'll start to understand, to, you'll start to understand what drive unbounced traffic. Um, by the way, I, that unbounced traffic is the first KPI I use. I don't use impression. I don't use clicks because there has been so many discussion about, about like the uh, fraudulent traffic. I mean, Augustine Fu on LinkedIn shares a lot about it. He's, he's amazing. If, if you're interested uh, to follow him, uh, anybody listening, if you're interested to hear more about it, um, look at him on, on LinkedIn. And so the first KPI I use is unbounced traffic. And then, and then I would look at the important pages uh, in the journey. And then I would try to understand how we can get from that the first the first KPI to the next one to the to the last one to the revenue. Um, B two B and B two C on on the if you go at the end of the funnel works a bit differently because B two B there is a lot of things happening once the the opportunity is open and you can influence a lot the decision after the op opportunity is open. B2C is not really the case. Um, and so, so what I usually do is that I use site traffic all the way to demo, to the, to the, to the start of the opportunity, to, to understand how many opportunities we can create, how much, how we can recreate most opportunity possible. And then from the opportunity start, then I use a probabilistic model that we look at CRM data. We're going back to this CRM data to understand what is the what is most what opportunity is most likely to convert and why, uh, because we actually can see a lot of. Um, I did see a lot of signals. Uh, for example, interaction email interaction between a sales team and um, and, and and people the uh, people uh, for example subscribing to some webinars. Uh, all of those actually make a big difference in the end. When you look at the data, all of those makes a big difference on the probability of the opportunity to convert. And also, obviously, um, there is there is also the size of the opportunity, the time the time to close. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's how I do it. Is that I have a model that updates over time uh, for each opportunity to provide a probability. And it, it was actually working very well. So that way of splitting the funnel and I have the probabilistic model. Um, I was I was able to get to get a very close um, AR number actually. When we move to the forecasting numbers, but that, that's that's how I solved the problem uh, for a big uh, tech company. Yes, and it's good. I mean, basically, then you know where to cut and when to where to invest more. You know, when you when you separate it like that, and when you can see the things from one step behind, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the great thing is that it's not only a forecasting tool; it's an optimization tool. Uh, because you can quickly see that depending on the initiative, you know the initiative that are going to drive more inbounds, um, and uh, what what initiative is is great after the the um, the, the opening of the opportunity, and uh, you can track that. But obviously, you need a solid serum in place, and I know that's another problem that a lot of companies face. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is what it is, but uh, if, if you want to get serious about your data and, and about your investment in, in everything that you do, marketing, sales, and all the other stuff, mm. you need to be serious about the tools that you are using. Yeah, the data is key. So what I've, what I've found out, I've been doing modeling for 15 years now, and what I see is that a very simple model with good data will always outperform a very, uh, a very complex model with bad data. And, and what I've learned over the years is that using mathematical and statistical solutions should be the last resort. If you are able to get the data for somewhere, don't stitch it, don't, don't true math at it. Try to solve the data problem because in the long term, you'll have something way more robust. Yeah, so um, since we already started, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, developing and implementing exactly the tools that we can get for the marketing budget optimization and those kind of things. So since we talk about the tools, uh, you know what people usually ask, you know, how do we use AI in that? Or do we use it? Or can it help us actually get better forecasting or predictions or those kind of things? Because one topic that's never gets out of the, the fashion when it comes to the marketing is predictable revenue. Can we actually predict it? 
We can, we can, and with 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 um with a with a good accuracy. Uh, the model I built was able to to always be within ninety percent of the the expected revenue uh, of the quarter, and then and so and so it was it was working very well. But the key is not AI. The key is data. So that's the thing. Um, and uh, and and that's that's something that again don't throwing matter the problem is not the right way. So and I have AI is amazing for a lot of things, but I have my current worries based on my experience is that people think that AI will solve the data problem, but it's not going to. It's not going to guess what it doesn't see. And so you need you need to show the model everything <laughs> if you want it to work. But yes, you can uh, you can forecast revenue quite accurately, uh, but you need to have, as I explained, uh, the, the way I see it's working very well is split the funnel and have a robust data strategy in place. Yeah, you remind me now, now of the thing. I mean, in each point when we are creating advertising campaign or any campaign on Google, on LinkedIn, whatever the platform is, you want to give the platform the final goal that you want to achieve, right? The, the big goal. So you can see all the way through the funnel and optimize based based on that if you don't give it to if you just give it you know this is the you know we just want them to go to the landing page we don't even track the thank you page for example they'll mm -hmm. really give you the people who can who will go to the page and not convert yeah you know, it's usually like that but uh, i want to mention an example i was working with a company uh who is basically you know, data and AI company that uh, enables telco e-commerce uh, companies to actually use their data to kind of improve the conversions on the website and some other stuff. Mm -hmm. But what I saw looking at all those companies is uh, each company measures and names and uh, sorts out data differently. And mm -hmm. it's a huge mess. And they and they can, the company can sell their tool easily. Everybody wants to have it. It's AI, it's sexy, you know, all these things, but they cannot do the onboarding and start working with those companies for a year, year and a half sometimes, depending yeah. on the size of the company, because they cannot sort the data. Yeah, yeah, that's the, yes, um, I've seen that a lot. Um, so on the B2B side, it's quite easier because you just connect directly to the channels and then you have the ETL that, that sorts everything. And so you don't rely on what the company has. On the B2B side, when you want to include the CRM, then it gets more complicated uh, to have. Uh, this is why when I was working for Oracle, I was always adamant that um, there was, it was more interesting to really work on, on um, data strategy inside, inside solution because that's a bit of a problem of, the, of SaaS I've seen is that SaaS is scalable if, because it's tried to fit for all. But often in B2B go to market because everything is so complicated, then you end up with stuff sometimes that is fits for none. <laughs> and so and so there is that there is that issue. Um, there is that issue with B2B uh, go to market SaaS. I, I agree with that. Um, but then the thing is, there is a positive way of looking at it is when you use a vendor and then you need to tidy up a bit the place to use a vendor. It's always positive to tidy up the place. Uh, it's a good it's a good opportunity to to make to make the thing cleaner uh, and and then and then more scalable. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask you about um, about this part? Because I want to also touch the marketing mix, modeling, you know, for the for the companies with huge sales cycles and, and all those things. Yeah, no, we can we can we can move to MMM. So MMM is um so what is MMM? So MMM instead of using tracking like MTA does, they use correlation. And the great thing is then, as I explained, the data does not exist to track the whole journey. And so the the theory is that oh, that means you can correlate the spend of a campaign with the revenue of the company, and then you understand you understand the impact without without needed of tr needing of tracking. Um, and that works very well for short cycle products um, because, uh, yeah, you see the distribution here. So if imagine the cycle and then you have a distribution 
And so if you have a short cycle, you'll have a very narrow distribution and very high. And so, and that will, and again, as I explained earlier, like the shorter to shoot, it's easier. And so when you have a very narrow distribution, the model will very easily detect the signal uh, from the noise. Imagine you have a very long consideration product, so you don't have a narrow distribution, you have something that looks like this, then uh, of distribution of, cy uh, of uh, cycle, then uh, the MMM will really struggle because it will not be able to detect the signal of the noise. And so for long consideration product, the concept of using spend impression to revenue does not work. Uh, you have, again, we come back to what I said earlier, we have to split the funnel. Um, one way to, to do it is, for example, for inbound, you can, you can just have inbound as a target, and then you have a probabilistic model after inbound. Uh, for B2C, you can use add to cart, for example. So you, you fit add to cart, and then you have a probabilistic model conversion to, to purchase. Mm -hmm. So the only solution really is to split the funnel. Uh, the problem is, again, we go back to the concept of, of SaaS, try to fit for all. Mm -hmm. A lot of um, MMM providers do not allow that, uh, that solution, and mm -hmm. they, will only, uh, they will only sell a product that fits uh, your spend with revenue. And obviously, because of the distribution issue, it's not going to detect the signal from the noise, and then it's going to, to send you some uh, weird insight. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing so many times I mean, the, the, the problem with, with all this is that people don't listen usually to the, you know, people like you and some others that talk about stuff with experience and, you know, have done it before because, you know, the articles, research uh, and all other data that coming from the vendors that offer, you know, uh, specific tools for that, it's all around the place. And they basically, when they go to search, they find those things instead of, you know, listening to you or some other knowledgeable people who, you know, actually can tell them, you know, do it, but think about this, this and this, pay attention to these things. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, well, that's the problem of selling, right? You, exactly. you, you have a strong incentive to not mention a problem. And this is why MTA vendors say you can connect your whole journey. No, you don't. Um, I'm quite annoyed when I see it on LinkedIn. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, I, I was having those kind of thoughts when, when I saw, I don't know which company w was that. Um, they were trying to uh, to prove that self-reported attribution doesn't work. Yeah. So, so they basically used it uh, and first of all, get to the page, all the paid traffic, and then said, oh, God, this data, it's not good. Because people gave them like Google or search on those kind of things. And, and I was looking at the data and I'm like, it's working. It tells you that your marketing isn't working. Actually, that you are just doing the paid thing. Mm -hmm. Right? It didn't tell them anything about, you know, I saw, I don't know, Charlie's post on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Or I saw your video inside, somebody posted in, in that community or in mm -hmm. our company chat. Or somebody recommended you. Like there's none of this data. You know, and you need to have also, you know, why are you doing something to prove that it's not working or to actually, uh, you know, get the data and act based on it? Yeah, so you, you touched something very important is that for the self attribution, it's so important to have, uh, it's so much better to have a text box in terms of multiple choices because you can say, as you said, oh, I saw Charlie's post um, instead of, uh, make, I, I understand. Reason why people don't recommend it is because on the back end is more complicated, but exactly. not anymore. With AI, it's so easy to categorize those ones. Um, and so, and so, yeah, definitely anybody uh, listening, the text box is better. And uh, yeah, we can, I can, I can share. It's actually, I have a post uh, a long time ago now, but that explained exactly how you can use AI to to categorize um, all of those free text uh, answers. Yeah, you, you'll send me and we'll end it in the in the notes. Um, but one thing is don't give people the choice. Make it as this is the field you need to uh, to fill in. And it's not like I'm going to tell you to choose out of these three things, but you need to come up with the answer. right? Mm -hmm. And it makes them think. 
you know, I usually add, you know, besides how did you hear about us, I ask, why do you want to work with us? Mm. It gives me even more depth, uh, you know, when it comes to when it comes to those things. And what I usually do working with the companies, I add the Slack channel when there's, you know, everybody from the C level to the marketing and some some other people, so they can see when each uh, you know conversion comes through the self-reported attribution, because you know then they can see what they wrote and they can actually then they do a you know small celebrations and like hey this guy wrote an article it gave us the lead yeah but, you know. So, so it's actually good. And this is also one way to merge kind of the C level and prove that what marketing does is effective. And I have seen by experience that self attribution is much, much closer to the sales note too than an MTA. So it, it is actually closer to the truth. This is why it's funny. It's like such a low investment is actually better than a lot of expensive tools. Exactly. Uh, but it comes, it comes with, uh, we, we can talk a bit of the issues of it. It comes with some, um, um, some well a negative point of obviously is that people might say something inaccurate and it is it's actually true but we have to accept it but what is important is to understand the concept of low of um, low of high numbers right if mm -hmm. if you have one answer yes maybe it might be wrong but if you have a hundred answers saying exactly the same thing yeah it might be 90 it might be 110 but it's definitely within that region uh, and that's and that's how you have to look at self attribution. You shouldn't look at it as the, you shouldn't look at it as you expect like a precise answer. You have to look at it as a whole uh, to see to see high volume. Where are the distribution? Where where what people say the most rather than really thinking, oh maybe that one was wrong. I've seen it also on LinkedIn. Oh yeah, that person they say something wrong on self attribution, so self attribution is wrong. No, it's not. It's not working like this. Uh, yes, there's going to be errors. Uh, but if you if you have a lot of volume, a lot of data, then it's fine. Yeah, I want to ask you something that came to my mind just now, because I was talking with with a friend. She uh, recently became the the CMO a couple of months ago, and you know, instead of having marketing goals, she decided that marketing should have the sales goals from the start, mm -hmm. so she can kind of align the team, uh, you know, so they can all start working together, and then. You know, in the near future, they will see maybe they will separate marketing goals and, you know, all of them around, around revenue or those kind of things. So uh, maybe what's your insight on that? Or, you know, how we measure marketing versus how we measure sales or, you know, we have the revenue as an umbrella and then everything under it. It's, it's a brilliant idea. When you think about it, um, all companies are built for one thing, maximize profit or minimize loss for, <laughs> for early startups. But, but that's, and so that should be the KPI for everybody. It should be the company's KPI. And, and so, and you can do it. For example, what can marketing do? They can create inbound traffic. They can warm outbounds. And, and so you're going to see so inbound traffic is quite is quite is quite easy to to find. It's just inbound traffic, although it's always better to check in your CRM if the sales team didn't contact that person before because then it's not really an inbound. But we go into technicalities. But yeah, that's one thing. Um, then you have warm outbound versus cold outbounds. If you do the difference and you ask a sales team to ask uh, to ask a prospect if they know about the company. You, you can categorize the two and you'll see a difference in conversion rate. That difference can be attributed. That's revenue can be, can, that is attributable to, to marketing. So you have the inbound, you have the retention rate, you have the uh, self, uh, sales cycles by, by mes providing messages around the main concerns of, of the people, of, uh, of potential buyers, uh, to what they're trying to solve. You can actually shorten the sales cycles. And so you can increase the the daily profit of the sales team that's also something you can attribute it to to the marketing and also finally retention rate you you if you build a big brand you have brand loyalty you have a bigger moat around your business you have higher retention rate and that's most complicated to measure but that's also something you can attribute it to marketing so there are so you can really at there are those four factors you can attribute a lot of revenue to marketing so um, it is possible. Um, it, it just needs a bit of setup, a building a data strategy and everything, but it is 100% uh, um, possible. There's, 
there's no, there's, I was going to say there's no excuse. It's a bit harsh, but um, you can do it. Uh, thanks for answering this. One more, and I think the last question from my side is, you know, if the company decides to build a data team to help them with that, mm -hmm. you know, they probably have like a couple of people in marketing, you know, they have a sales team. So they, they want to build a data team to kind of empower, you know, all their efforts. So what would you suggest how to start and how to, how to build that thing? Um, you need to find, and they exist, I was one. <laughs> you need to find data experts or data expert I would, to, that, that understand go to market. So, mm -hmm. and, um, and the thing is, if you find a good data engineer, uh, well, you know, there's, there's so much content online. It's quite easy today to, uh, to understand how a go to market works. Just, just listen to this podcast. <laughs> Uh, so, so yes, yeah, so that's the most important thing. Start with the data engineering, the problem, the in engineer. And the reason is because a data scientist uh, needs pipeline, data pipeline that often are built by the data engineers. What I end up doing is that I started the data scientist and then I end up doing both because I had no, because I had, I had no data engineer to, uh, to help me. But the first hire, if you have to pick one of the two, will be the data engineer. Um, who will work on getting all the data together? Because again, as I explained, you you try you have you have to try to choose the least amount of math possible. You have to you have mm. to try to solve your problem with data, not with math. Data scientists do math. Data engineer build put data together, um, and that's that's where to start. But and then and but what you need to what we need also is to an, an understanding from the sales and marketing team of what a good go-to-market is. And I think there's a lot of work to do there too at, at this stage. Uh, you have a lot of sales team who do not want to share uh, the attribution of revenue. And you have a lot of marketing teams who who still are stuck in, in and it's not always their fault that we explain it's because we gave them those incentives, but are stuck in, in uh, measurement that are, that are part of the past. Yeah, uh, often they don't even request the access to the CRM and, and go and analyze things. I think, you know, this year or maybe the year before things changed, mm. and marketers actually started getting the access to that. And it, and I can see it changes a lot the way they work, the way they talk about things, you know, because they can actually see how the revenue is coming. Yeah. You know, and, and they're closer to it. So, so they're they see, okay, is what I'm doing actually affecting that or no? Mm. Oh, I, I've seen cases where the sales team absolutely did not want the marketing team to have access to the CRM. And my answer to that is, uh, how, do they, how, do you, how do you want them to bring the right leads with the right messaging to you? Like how? If you don't share, them the, if you don't share the information with them, they won't be able to do it. Um, and yes, there is a data silo problem there. Uh, we're siloing the data between the sales and the marketing because we're still looking at it as a as a production production chain. You know, marketing creates the leads. The leads are taken by the sales. It doesn't work like this anymore. We, you need, really need those two teams to work together. And you mentioned, you said you were asking a question, which was, "Why do you want to work with us?" It's such a powerful question because it can really help you to better understand what is the messaging you need to use online, and. And sales team with specific question of, do you know the company? Why are you contacting us? What problem are you trying to achieve exactly? And you want the person to tell you the problem. You don't want the salesperson to say, here's how we solve your problem. It's complete. It's two different answers. But once, if the sales team is, is getting all of this information from the prospect and share this with marketing, it's so powerful because then the marketing team has a capability to really adapt the messaging to the perfect audience, to the people who are converting the most and really get that, that revenue growing. Yeah, that, that's actually brilliant. We mentioned some of, some of the examples. Everybody listening can go to the episode with, with Adam Kirsch about setting up the, the homepage. We mentioned how you, you know, some good examples and how people get the data and kind of put them in the head section of the website, mm -hmm. which is how they differentiate, you know, based on the customer insights and those kind of things. But tell me, uh, tell me and everybody listening, what's next for you in the next period and when they can find more, more information about you. So uh, the best way to find me is on LinkedIn. I'm going to start to, to create, I'm working on building more educational content about measurement. 
So it is going to be a Twitter, a YouTube page with more information. Uh, but I'm going to share all of these on LinkedIn. So one, what's next to me is really solving the long condition consideration uh, cycle measurement. That that's what uh, really that's what gets me up in the morning when the kids didn't wake me up before. Um, and, <laughs> and yeah, that's that's what I'm planning to do for the next year. It's it's very exciting. It's a very exciting journey. There's so much to do. Um, there's so many challenge because you know a lot of people have like the the you know we've done it all. people yeah right with, with yeah. you know extreme opinions yeah and so and so it's great it's brilliant i'm learning a lot from the process and i do see that there is there's actually so much to be done we say that half of the marketing is budget is wasted i think i think it's true um so let's close a 300 billion dollar gap and uh and move forward with it love it that, that's a great message for the end uh, <laughs> Guys, if, if you are listening now, I, I want you to stop. Uh, go back to the beginning of the episode. Listen again. Stop when you need to stop. When you need to understand some of the things, go back to the to the show notes. We'll add some links over there. Some uh, you know post that Charlie wrote uh, to talk about all these things. Uh, even send him a message if you have a question. I'm sure he'll he'll answer. Um, and. Uh, Charlie, thanks again for, for taking the time and talking with me about, about all these things and actually giving me, you know, because I, I know a lot of stuff, but I don't actually do the job, mm. right? A, a lot of times. So it's good when I have somebody who actually did some of the things to kind of give me the nitty gritty details and everybody listening can actually get, get the value in, you know, having maybe the clear perspective on how to set up, set themselves up for the success. Yeah, so I do offer two a free session um, of 30 minutes every week. Um, I do this because I meet more people, I understand people's problems. So uh, do reach me, uh, connect with me, and uh, and if you're interested to discuss to discuss some of the problems you face, I'm more than happy to to discuss this with you. Perfect. We'll add, add a link for that as well, or it can be your your LinkedIn page. I don't know how it. It's on my LinkedIn page. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, guys, for the end, as I always say, keep it funky and see you in the next episode. Cheers. Bye.